Hey everyone, in this video I'm going to be continuing my Mark Miller coverage by breaking down another book of his called Chrononauts. This book is about two bro guy scientists that are geniuses that invent a time machine and they use it to travel through various periods of time. Initially, their time travel pursuits are for the betterment of mankind, for scientific interests, but then eventually they use this time machine for their own needs, to collect cool shit, to make themselves powerful, and for the betterment of themselves. And this is a pretty fun, amusing, wish-fulfillment story that goes to some interesting places. And there is, of course, some villains that will try to damper their travels through time. But yeah, this one is highly entertaining. Let's dive into it now. Chrononauts. Chrononauts, written by Mark Miller, art by Sean Gordon Murphy, and colors by Matt Hollingsworth. Chrononauts, issue one. In Southeast Turkey, we meet one of our main characters, a scientist named Dr. Corbin Quinn. He is led to an old temple that predates Stonehenge by 6,000 years. He is here to see an odd discovery. Inside that temple is an F-14 Tomcat fighter plane that apparently went missing in the 1970s. Somehow it wound up here, buried deep within the catacombs of the temple, with no explanation of how it got there. Later on, back in Texas, Dr. Quinn is sitting in his office at NASA headquarters where a new partner for Quinn has arrived, a blonde-haired man named Dr. Danny Riley. Dr. Corbin Quinn and Dr. Danny Riley are our main characters in this book, and they will soon become the time-traveling adventurers known as Chrononauts. The two of them discuss various artifacts that have been found around the world. Corbin explains all these strange things that have been found around the world. He says, Thousand-year-old motorbikes, 500-year-old speedboats, that fleet of sports cars they found beneath the Mayan temples. All these artifacts displaced in time just gives me hope that we're on the right track. Danny Riley asks Corbin, You're really building a time machine in this place? Corbin answers, It's really more of a satellite. At this stage, we see there is a satellite in space, which is apparently traveling through the time stream, recording images of the past. The satellite is named the Mark Twain One. The Mark Twain One is on a test run. It travels back in time to the Battle of Gettysburg during the American Civil War in July of 1863. The satellite begins sending live video footage of Gettysburg back to the current day. This is a monumental historic moment akin to the moon landing. Millions of people all over the world are watching this live footage from the past. They see the Confederates taking on the Union. People are watching from their work, from the street, from their living room, schools, even from strip clubs. The people watching this moment of history live on their television screens. They share a mix of emotions from being terrified as well as being in awe and entertained. 18 months later, the two chrononauts, Corbin Quinn and Danny Riley, are being interviewed on a live television. Elsewhere, we see a couple in their living room with their television on. The man in the room speaks to the woman and asks her, How can you boycott this, Rachel? This is history right now happening in front of us. The woman in the room is named Rachel. Rachel is Dr. Corbin Quinn's ex-wife. Rachel tells the man that she's not interested in watching this. Back in Texas to the Chrononauts being interviewed, a reporter asks Corbin and Danny what the time machine is going to look like. Corbin responds that many of his past prototypes were bulky and impractical vehicles. So, he brought on his new teammate and co-engineer, Dr. Danny Riley from MIT, to execute his engineering designs and shrink them down into a simple suit. 
Danny Riley then introduced to the crowd, shows off some special gear that they will wear on their missions. These special outfits are called chrono suits, and he explains that these suits not only will allow them to move around comfortably through time, but it will also allow them to carry and bring things with them, too. Dr. Corbin Quinn explains that these suits and their technology are so advanced that the batteries within them will remain charged for 100 years. We then meet a news reporter named Cindy Porter. Cindy Porter is from CNN, and she asks, if any trip to the past poses a threat to the present time, she wants to know if their missions can be a mistake, change history and endanger the world for everybody as they know it today. To this, Danny Riley replies to Miss Porter, not to worry, as Corbin Quinn does not make any mistakes. We now head over to their Nevada facility on launch day. Today is the day that Corbin and Danny will travel through time and make a manned mission to the past. While all the preparations are being made behind the scenes, Corbin takes a moment to look at his vintage stopwatch that his father had gifted him a long time ago. An inscription on it reads, To Corbin, may all the dreams come true. Love, Dad. With his father now passed on, Corbin often looks at this special keepsake to remember his father by and remind him that dreams can come true. Before Corbin prepares to launch, he gives his ex-wife Rachel a call. Rachel on the phone asks him, Don't you have something more important you should be doing right now? Corbin, he tells her, I'm calling to apologize, Rachel. It wasn't until I was standing here getting ready for the jump that I realized just how much I'd sacrificed for all this. You were a good wife. You deserved a better husband. I should have been more attentive. Like, I should have been there for my dad more often, too. Rachel asks him, Are you worried something's going to go wrong in there? Corbin replies to her, No, I'm just aware that it's the biggest day of my life and there's nobody left to say goodbye to. Curse of the overachiever, huh? And after all this sentiment is shared, Corbin, he then complains to his ex-wife, saying, How could you leave me for that sleazy lawyer? As her operating team at the hospital is waiting for her, Rachel tells him, He made time for me, Corbin. She then hangs up. We see in the background, Danny kisses that reporter, Cindy Porter. They just recently started dating. He says goodbye to her. Cindy tells Danny to promise to be careful on the mission. As they finish their embrace, Danny walks back over to Corbin and tells him, I swear to God, I'm going to marry that girl when I get back. Corbin questions back, You've known her precisely five days. Danny quips back saying, Hey, <laughs> I didn't say it was going to last. As the cameras are still rolling, Danny tells Corbin, Don't worry about this Rachel thing, man. When we get back from this trip, you'll be the biggest thing on the college lecture circuit. You'll be banging every co-ed from here to Timbuktu. Corbin warns Danny, You realize this is all being recorded and broadcast around the world, right? Danny to this says, Yeah, man, obviously. Danny then finger shoots, pointing to the cameras. The seconds are counting down. Corbin and Danny are now ready for takeoff. To the past. They've got their chrono suits on and their little cameras attached. They are set to land in the year 1492 when Christopher Columbus first discovered the New World. They are going to film it. Danny tells Corbin, see you on the other side, bro. As the countdown ends, Quinn heads first back in time. His body enters, but then something goes wrong. He gets hit. A male operating attendant in the background says to Danny, Shit! Quinn's been hit by some kind of wave and knocked off course. His line went down in 1986. We can't get through on any of the comm links. The live broadcast around the world continues. Danny, he says, We must go after him. He tells everyone to get out of his way. And then a man comes from behind him. This man is named Mannix. Mannix works for the security division of their operation. Mannix tells Danny, 
Time jump is suspended, Dr. Riley. A female operating attendant then yells out, This is a disaster! According to his tracer, Corbin's in Samarakand. Every second he's back there, he's a danger to the present day. Danny responds, so bring him home. The operator continues, it's not that simple, doctor. The more we send, the greater the risk. Whoever goes back needs to go alone. Danny tells her that he's ready and more than game to go. The operator tells him, you can't have a gun, Danny. We can't even risk a vehicle and there's no way of telling how hostile the locals are going to be. Danny continues, I don't care. My friend is in trouble and I want him back. Corbin's safety is the only thing that matters. The male operator in the room then says, there's no denying Danny's by far the best qualified. They all then decide to fire up the time machine and send Danny back in time after Corbin. Danny confirms with them saying, I'll stay in touch through the 4D link, but I don't anticipate any complications. As soon as I find him, I'll bring him straight back. We won't be hanging around. Danny, he then passes through and time travels to the time and place that Corbin was redirected to when he got hit. Danny arrives in Samarakand in the year 1504. Samarakand is a city in the Middle East in a country called Uzbekistan. As soon as Danny arrives, he is immediately in danger and an arrow pierces him through his leg. Then we see an army of men in metal armor riding horseback through a battle with Danny stuck right in the middle of it all. And in the crossfire, Danny almost gets hit again with another arrow right to his chest. But luckily, his helmet gets in the way, protecting him. Next issue, we will learn more about Danny and Corbin's time in 1504. Chrononauts Issue 2 Danny is stuck in the middle of the crossfire in Samarakand in the year 1504. It looks more like a scene from Mad Max. We see vehicles and war machines and helicopters, all which would not be here in that time frame. Danny is begging the people, telling them, Stop! I'm here on a rescue mission! One of the men, a leader on one of the two sides, whose name is General Savar, he says out loud, That's right, you cowards! Flee to your horse and tell them that we're unbeatable. Our city walls will not be breached. One of General Savar's men captures Danny and asks him, What about the blonde one? To this, Danny responds, Hey, my name's Danny Riley and I'm looking for my friend, Dr. Corbin Quinn. You have my word. I have nothing to do with whatever is going on here. General Savar seems surprised to hear that name. Danny Riley? General Savar then yells, Transport! Take us back to the palace and inform the king that we have found his companion. His royal highness has been expecting you, sir. He will be most pleased to see his old friend after all this time. Back at the headquarters of the Chrononauts in the present day. They are watching footage from Danny of all of this and they are wondering, what's going on here? We sent Quinn back over 500 years. How the hell do they have bombs and military hardware? Back to 1504. General Savar continues talking to Danny and tells him, Do not be afraid, Doctor. We're hardly savages. Samarakand is an oasis of enlightenment since the arrival of Dr. Quinn. My men will tend to your wounds as we journey to the city. As they are heading off, Danny is in disbelief. He says to the general, Yeah, right. As they approach the city, General Savar radios in, Foxtrot to base! Open the main gates! Danny isn't quite sure where he is, but... He's thinking he kind of likes it so far. Then, a familiar voice calls out to him. Well, 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 look what the cat dragged in. Corbin, dressed like royalty, comes down the stairs and greets his friend. Danny is shocked. He can't believe he's seeing Corbin dressed this way right now. Corbin embraces Danny and asks him, Do you know how long I've been waiting for you? Danny says he doesn't understand. He says, what are you talking about? 
You've only been gone 40 minutes. Corbin responds, Actually, I got stranded here almost four years ago now. Thank you, Sarbar. Your men have done very well. We now learn that not only has a longer period of time passed for Corbin outside of the present day, but also General Sarvar is actually the servant of this new royalty, Corbin of Samarakand. General Sarvar tells his master, Yes, master, we live to serve your highness. Corbin explains to Danny that Sarvar is the head of my private army. He used to be famed as their greatest warrior, but I've never met a more loyal servant. Corbin then tells Sarvar and his men, Thank you, gentlemen. You defended your city most honorably this afternoon. Danny asks, what has Corbin been doing in this place? Corbin answers, just protecting them from the Mogul army. They've been living under constant threat from them. I brought them hardware that blew their minds and they made me leader almost overnight. Danny confused asks, but where did you find the choppers? Corbin responds, Vietnam, the first Gulf War. Anywhere I could lay my hands on something. Danny tells Corbin that they thought that he was stranded out here. Corbin tells him that, Nah, once I fix the time suit, I could go anywhere. Danny wonders, why didn't he come back home? Corbin replies to this, To what? No wife, no dad, no anything except my work. Back home, I've got nothing, dude. Here, I'm a king. Back at the Chrononauts headquarters in the present day. The operators and management team are not liking the sound of this conversation they are hearing. They say that somebody better call Mannix. I think he's going to need backup. Back to 1504. Danny tells Corbin, You can't just mess around with a time stream like this. You've got to be logical, Corbin. Corbin responds, I spent my life being logical. And look where it got me. My dad dies from chronic alcoholism, and my wife leaves me for another man. Rachel and I had a perfect little thing going, but I blew it all up just by working too hard. As Corbin is explaining all of this, Danny asks him where they're going. Corbin continues, The chrono suit takes things anywhere we want, right? Let's take a little tour, and I'll show you what I've been up to. Suddenly, they are back in 1961 this time in Paris. Corbin explains, This is Paris in the 60s. I've got a place over there by the Seine, and Jean-Paul Sartre drops by for lunch. They then time jump to Egypt, to the year 3000 BC. Corbin explains, In ancient Egypt, the people call me a pharaoh. They then go to Japan, the year 1220. Corbin explains, In Japan, I'm the leader of the uh, Kamakuro Shogunate. Day. They then jump to New York in 1929. Corbin says, In New York City, I just made a fortune on the stock exchange, building quite the little empire here. Suddenly, a cop drives beside Corbin and tells him, Hey, pull over! You're doing over 50 in a 30 mile an hour zone. But soon, the cop recognizes Corbin and says, Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Quinn. I didn't realize it was you. Corbin tells the officer, That's quite all right. And for him to say hello to his lovely family. Danny asks Corbin, is this all for real? Corbin tells him, oh yeah. They're even talking about running me as a senator next time. They then pull up to a palatial estate. Something that looks like it's right out of the Great Gatsby. Corbin asks Quinn, now what do you think of this new house I just bought? It's something, isn't it? As they head inside the mansion, a full-on party is going on. Some of the women are gossiping in the background. One is saying, Look, it's Corbin Quinn. I heard he was back in town. Another woman responds, McClure's magazine called him the most fascinating man in America. A young blonde woman atop the stairs asks Corbin, Where have you been, handsome? I've been waiting for you all night. This woman is gay or lava. Corbin replies to her, Sorry, sweetheart, just catching up with an old friend. Give me a minute to get changed upstairs, and I'll be back before you can stir another cocktail. Corbin tells Danny that this lady friend of his, Gay Orlava, is the girlfriend of a gangster named Lucky Luciano. Danny, to this, wonders, 
Isn't that a little dangerous? Corbin to this replies, Yeah, sure is, but it's exciting. Corbin then goes on to show his wardrobe to Danny and the many different outfits he wears for all of his many different lives he lives. He then shows Danny a chart of all of his many different girlfriends and all the many different times and places he lives. Check out some of these names. He's dating Norma Jean Baker, who we know as Marilyn Monroe, Cleopatra, Cheryl Crow, Amelia Earhart, Joan of Arc, Gay Orlava, Tana Ford, Betty Page, Betty White, and Betsy Ross. Corbin tells Danny that he is living the life they have both always dreamed of, and that he should switch off the tracking device in his time suit now. And if he does so, he could live this life, too. Corbin explains the only reason he left his tracking device on is so that Danny could find him, and they could live this life together. In the background, the agents from the headquarters of Chrononauts are overhearing all of this. They tell Danny through radio, Mannix is getting into a backup suit, Riley. Just hold Quinn until he gets there. Ignoring this, Danny tells Corbin, I have to admit, it does look pretty sweet. Corbin continues, hey, These batteries stay charged for a hundred years. Could you imagine the laughs we'd have out here with these things? Look, I know you got a girl back home, but how long have you been dating her? Five days? Danny responds, Actually, it's more like four and a half. Back in the current day, Cindy Porter, the girl that Danny was dating, overhears this. She does not seem to please with Danny's response. Corbin continues saying, Once the trackers are switched off, they won't even know where to look for us. Time and space would be ours to kick around in, man. Isn't that better than the Nobel Prize for Physics? Danny, thinking on this, decides, you know what? He's right, man. It's a once-in-a-lifetime chance. Danny turns off his tracking device. In the present day, some of the Chrononaut employees there are losing their minds. They say, shit, now there's two of them on the loose. Back in 1929, New York, Danny says to Corbin that they're going to be in so much trouble for this. Corbin excitedly responds, <laughs> yeah, but it'll be worth it. They then start jumping through time to a whole bunch of different places. They land somewhere during the age of dinosaurs 65 million years ago. Then in Scotland in 1314, where the men on the battlefield hail Danny Riley as their new king for helping them defeat the English. Then in the Bronx, USA, 530 million years ago, where they witnessed the world's first mammal crawling out of the sea and how this was the start of evolution for who humankind became today. Forget Christopher Columbus landing in America. They thought this was a bigger one to capture on film. Then they jump to Bethlehem 2,000 years ago for the birth of Jesus Christ. They can't believe they are filming this historic religious event. One of the shepherds tells them, Gentlemen, I do not wish to embarrass you, but it is customary to bring gifts when visiting a newborn. The other kings have brought frankincense and myrrh. What have you brought for the king of all kings? Corbin says all he's got is this gold chain that he can offer the newborn king. Danny, looking at the chain, realizes that there's a crucifix at the end of it. Danny says, dude, that's a crucifix. Are you trying to freak the baby out? They then time jump to Las Vegas, 1951. Here we see Corbin meeting up with Marilyn Monroe. They are having a good old time together at the casino, playing blackjack and roulette, and they are winning like crazy because the night before, Corbin time-traveled here and wrote tonight's winning numbers down. Then back in Samarkand in the year 1504, Corbin returns to his palace with Danny while General Savar is keeping a good eye on his master. Danny says to Corbin, We've got money, we've got power, we've got armies at our disposal. What could be better than life right now? Corbin almost seems a little sad for a moment. He's looking out in the distance and says, Nothing much. It appears that maybe something is missing right now for Corbin that he isn't letting on about just yet. 
back in New York in 1929 while Corbin is traveling somewhere else in time and space. We see that that gay or lava girlfriend of his has discovered Corbin's private room where he keeps all of his outfits to time travel with, and a long list of women's names that he is seeing all across the globe and behind her back. She tells her friend that she knew it, and no wonder he kept the door locked all the time. Gay Orlava says that she always had a hunch that he was seeing other women, but he had no idea it was on this kind of scale. She tells her friend that she is going to report this all to her boyfriend, Lucky Luciano, the mobster. Back at the headquarters of the Chrononauts in the present day and time. One of the female operators exclaims, The batteries! We can trace them through the batteries. There's nothing like them anywhere in the time stream, so we can find them as easily if they were wearing the trackers themselves. The group applauds that she is a genius for thinking of this. She then asks Mannix if he is ready for a time jump to track them down. Mannix tells her, Catch these two assholes. I'm more than ready. Now, Switch off the television cameras, ma'am. Things are about to get messy in here. Chrono Nuts Issue 3 While Corbin is taking a fancy steamy shower and decompressing back in New York 1929, Danny has time jumped over to England in the year 1986. There, he is a rock star in the English band The Smiths. We meet a bandmate named Morrissey, and Danny is giving Morrissey the middle finger as he says to him, Look, if you don't like it, you can just leave the band, Morrissey. Morrissey replies to Danny, Why well, should I be the one to go? Danny says, Because I'm the guy who wrote all the songs, dude. No offense, but <laughs> I don't see it working out if it's only you and Johnny. Another bandmate, Johnny Marr, adds to Morrissey, He's right, mate. You can't deny Danny's a genius. He didn't just write the Beatles' best songs, he created Harry Potter and Breaking Bad. Then a lady interrupts them, saying that a telegram has arrived here for Dr. Danny Riley. Danny asks her, can it wait? They're in the middle of something important here. She tells him, it's been marked highly urgent, sir, and from another Dr. Danny Riley. See a relative? Danny, realizing that this is probably important, takes the telegram and reads it. It reads, Dear me, there isn't much time. Corbin's been killed, and I've been fatally wounded, but you can still fix this by heading to our 1929 house on October 21st at 6.01 a.m. Wait outside the southwest window and bring a really, really fast car. Best wishes, you. Danny begrudgingly tells Morrissey, alright, he's back in the band. Try not to make him regret it. Danny then time travels away. Back in New York in 1929, as Corbin is finishing off his steamy shower, he reaches for his robe as a group of mobsters are there waiting in their black suits and hats, forcing Corbin to come with them. They head downstairs where we meet gangster Lucky Luciano. He was the boyfriend of Gay Orlova, Corbin's love interest in New York who discovered his wardrobe and lengthy lady chart tracking all the girls he was dating. Lucky says to Corbin, well, 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 if it isn't the goddamn Casanova. If you're wondering where your fancy suit is, the boys and me have been having a barbecue. Lucky is burning the chrono suit on a barbecue. Lucky, he then goes on about the chrono suit. I don't know how this thing worked, but it doesn't anymore. Gay says this is how you got all this stuff. It must be sad seeing it go up in smoke. Corbin says to Lucky, you have no idea what you're doing here. Lucky responds, Hey, I could say the same, asshole. Did you really think you were going to get away with jumping my girl? Before I pull the trigger, I want you to know this is all going to be mine. The house, the cars, the money. You took what belonged to me, so I'm taking what belonged to you. Say hello to that bitch in hell, huh? And then a loud gunshot rings off with accompanying blood splatter. Oh no, this cannot be good. Could Danny's telegram have been right about Corbin being killed? But then we see 
It wasn't Corbin that was killed at all. Lucky Luciano and his henchmen were all shot by Mannix and some other Chrononaut security soldiers that have arrived here from the present day. They have come to collect Corbin and Danny and bring them back home and stop them from playing these foolish and dangerous time games. Even though Danny hasn't arrived back yet, they are looking to find him soon as well. Mannix, he reports back to Chrononaut's headquarters saying, Basic man, this is Alpha Team. We've tracked him down, but he's lost his suit. It looks like they cooked everything except the battery. The female operator on the other end reports back to Mannix saying, But you need to find Riley as soon as possible. Having one idiot loose in the time stream is just as bad as having two. Mannix reports back, Roger that. All while this is going on, we see Corbin. He escapes by running at the window and jumping out of it. As soon as Corbin lands on the ground, Danny is there in a really, really fast car, just when the telegram told him to be. Danny, trying to catch Corbin, tells him, Corbin, stay where you are, I got you, man. Sorry, dude, it was the only way. Corbin, he manages to get into the car after a bit of a rough tumble, while Mannix and his crew try to stop them from getting away. Corbin and Danny continue their time jumping in an effort to lose Mannix and his team. First, they time travel and drive through a football field during a live Super Bowl game in Miami in 1969. Mannix and his crew are continuing after them, driving on the field. This Mannix, he is ruthless, driving into people when he should be exercising greater caution during such a historical event. Then, Danny and Corbin, they escape the Super Bowl field and arrive in London in 1895. They then time travel again, and now we're in the Colosseum in Rome in 203 AD, interrupting a chariot race as they are going around in circles. Mannix is in tow not far behind. As Corbin and Danny crash into Mannix's military vehicle, they then make their way out of there and they do another time jump and land in Kursk, in 1943, Mannix is somehow caught up with the duo again. One of Mannix's men manages to jump and land on the hood of Corbin and Danny's car. Danny tells Corbin to shoot him, but Corbin replies, I didn't bring a gun. They then time jump again, this time to Dallas, Texas in 1963. They enter the motorcade on the day when President John F. Kennedy was assassinated, but Corbin and Danny they accidentally steered JFK's car off of the road while trying to fend off of Mannix's car, and they save JFK's life. Corbin and Danny continue driving, Mannix's henchmen still hanging on the front of their car. Up in the book depository, Lee Harvey Oswald is aiming through his sniper. He's trying to shoot JFK. He fires, but he doesn't hit JFK. The bullet instead hits Mannix's henchman that was on the front of Corbin and Danny's car, and the bullet killed him instead. Corbin and Danny continue driving off. Now, they make their way over to China in 212 BC, six years before the Great Wall of China was supposedly complete. They're driving on the Great Wall of China, and they drive off where the wall has ended, and their car goes flying, and they now time jump again. They enter a portal into the Grand Canyon in the year 1452. Mannix's henchman, the one that got shot and killed by Lee Harvey Oswald, well, he stayed on the hood of Danny and Corbin's car for a few time jumps, and he doesn't fall off until right here in the Grand Canyon in 1452. This will be important later. Anyway, Mannix, still in his vehicle, is trailing behind Danny and Corbin. The car chase then continues to the year 65 million BC, a long, long time ago. Mannix and his driver are not far from Danny and Corbin now. Mannix pulls out a rocket launcher, he aims it right at their car. But just then, as Mannix is taking aim and about to fire, a dinosaur tramples on Mannix's military vehicle, crushing it. Danny and Corbin do another time jump and finally make their way to safety, landing back at Corbin's palace in Samarkand in 1504. 
Corbin, still wearing his comfy bathrobe through all of this, says to Danny, This has to stop, Danny. People have been killed. We can't do any more time jumps, man. We need to get rid of that suit. Danny responds, couldn't we just turn ourselves in? Corbin tells him, are you crazy? They'd put us in jail and throw away the key. We need to go before they send another team. They're tracking us through the battery, so we need to ditch it fast. Corbin gets one of his assistants and tells him, yeah, give Danny's suit to Sarvar and tell him to get it as far from here as possible. He needs to ride east with his 10 best men and bury it deep where nobody will find it. So Corbin, with his own chrono suit, having been barbecued to bits by Lucky Luciano back in future New York, 1929, he entrusts the last chrono suit of the pair, Danny's, to be buried deep in the ground and with the help of his general, Sarvar, of course. Danny follows Corbin's direction, takes off his suit, and he says to Corbin, What about us? They saw this place when we first came here. The two of them are going to have to leave. Corbin responds, So, we grab what we can and get out of here and start a new life in London with all of our loot. Danny asks, Well, how do we get to London? Corbin responds, Well, I guess it depends. Corbin shows Danny his garage with his massive collection of aircrafts, and he tells him, which jet do you like best? Back at the Chrononauts base in the present day, the operations team are discussing what is happening. A manager there declares, Mannix is gone. Alpha team's been wiped out. It's going to take months to get more Chrono suits developed. Things are definitely not looking good from their perspective. Back in Samarakand in 1504, Corbin is looking at the watch his father gifted him so long ago. He rereads it to himself during times of seeking comfort and wisdom from his long lost dad. Once again, the watch reads To Corbin, may all the dreams come true. Love, Dad. Danny, seeing Corbin looking at his watch, asks him, Is he okay? Corbin responds, Yeah, I'm just thinking about my dad. One of the things I wanted to do back here was help fix his drinking problem. Maybe he could live a little longer. I just didn't know where to start. Danny tells him, Yeah, it's hard, dude. An alcoholic needs to want to stop. Corbin responds, Yeah, but I should have at least tried, you know. Corbin continues telling his friend Danny, It's the same as when he was alive, man. You always just think you're going to have more time. The two men then get interrupted by a guard that tells them, You're forbidden to leave the city, Dr. Quinn. Corbin tells the guard, Says who? Get out of our way, or you'll have Sarvar to deal with. General Sarvar then comes out from the crowd and speaks on behalf of the guard who was just talking to Corbin. Sarvar tells Corbin and Danny, I'd been watching you for months before I realized it was the suit. I was wondering how to steal it before you dropped it in my lap. Corbin can't believe what he is hearing. Sarvar is betraying him, his most trusted and loyal servant. Earlier, when Corbin ordered his assistant to bring the suit to Sarvar for him to bury it in the desert, Corbin just gave Sarvar exactly what he wanted. Sarvar now reveals under his cape that he never actually buried the time travel suit, and he has it with him right now, and he demands to Corbin and Danny that they show him how it works. Chrononauts issue 4. This is the final issue of this book. Back at the Chrononauts base in the present day, the operation team are discussing what is going on and how Corbin and Danny, who are still currently in Samarkand in the year 1504, how they could impact literally billions of people by the way they are altering history. They then get a radio interruption from the past that says, Base Command, this is Mannix, back in 65 million years BC. Mannix happens to still be alive and he is getting in contact with Base. He continues, My team got trampled by a herd of dinosaurs, but I've only sustained minor injuries. 
I've got a trace on a suit in Samarkand, and I'm heading there now to finish these assholes. But then, Mannix suddenly gets trampled on by another dinosaur, this time being squashed and actually killed. This time, it looks like Mannix spoke too soon. Back over in Samarkand in the year 1504, General Servar is talking to Corbin and Danny, who he has now taken captive. He says to them, I used to be general in the army before I served as your security. My specialty was extracting information from enemy soldiers. Now you and your friend might pretend to be these mighty warriors, but we both know you are merely scientists. So let me ask you one more time. Tell me how this suit works, or my swordsman will have your head. Corbin replies, go to hell. Servar continues, do you know what I could become with those powers? What I could do with this region if I had control of the future and the past? Corbin says to Servar, that's why you're getting jack shit. Servar is through with this nonsense, and he punches Corbin and knocks him to the ground. Sarvar then tells his men, Take the blonde one to the torture room. He knows as much as the doctor does anyway. We can start with his genitals and see where we go from there. As Corbin and Danny are being dragged away from each other, Corbin says to Danny, Danny, can you forgive me for getting you into this man? Danny responds, Of course I do. You're my best friend. This isn't over yet, dude. Servar, hearing this bromance of an exchange taking place, tells them both, Yes, it is. The guards follow Servar's command and take Corbin to the edge of a cliff outside of the city. One of the guards tells Corbin, It's hard to believe you were a king this morning. Look at you now, all bloodied and broken. A beggar would be ashamed. Another guard yells out, Throw him down the hill. Let the dogs finish him off. The guards' final words to Corbin as they throw him off the cliff are, Don't worry, Doctor. We'll take good care of your friend. Corbin, then thrown off this cliff, falls to the ground. The guards leave Corbin down there on the ground, and they state that without any friends or powers, he surely won't last the night. Some wild dogs starving for flesh surround Corbin. Corbin begins to narrate, they were wrong to write me off. Yeah, I was stranded and beaten to hell, but I've got an IQ of 240, and one thing I was famous for is never giving up. My dad was a drinker, so I was paying the bills from the age of seven. We didn't have any cash, but I still won a scholarship to Harvard, Oxford, Cambridge, and MIT. They told me time travel was impossible, so I spent the next ten years proving I was right defying Isaac Newton and Albert Einstein. I wasn't going to get beaten by a dog. My friend was in trouble and needed my help. Corbin managed to fight the dogs off, making them retreat. We then somehow see Corbin trekking through India and then Pakistan. We see Corbin continuing on foot. He is now leaving Europe. He's on a sailboat in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. On the ship, some of the crew ask him, how long have you been traveling now, Dr. Quinn? Corbin tells them, 18 months. And it hasn't been easy, but I'm halfway there. I'll find what I'm looking for by Christmas, and then I'm going to go back to save Danny from those psychopaths. The men ask Corbin, well, we didn't mean to be morbid, but wouldn't they have killed him after all this time? Corbin responds, well, theoretically, yes, but... If what I think is out there, death won't even be an issue. We now see Corbin in the middle of a desert somewhere, and he continues his narration. You see, there's one little detail everyone else forgot. A man who dropped in the middle of nowhere, dressed in something very useful. And if he's still there, all bets are off. Those batteries I built last a hundred years. And if I've done my math correctly, there's 46 years left. It is revealed that Corbin has traveled to the Grand Canyon. The year now is 1506. Mannix's henchman, the one that got shot and killed by Lee Harvey Oswald, well, 
His body was stuck on the hood of the car Danny and Corbin were driving, and his body didn't fall off until they time jumped a few times and eventually made their way to the Grand Canyon in 1452. That henchman's body and chrono suit were still lying there in that desert for 54 years. Corbin, happy that he is right and that the chrono suit is still there, exclaims, Yes! He can now time travel again and save himself and Danny. Corbin with the chrono suit once again begins traveling throughout the world and through different time periods. He moves through Norway in the year 812 AD, then through Sparta in the year 431 BC, then through France during 1916 AD, and then throughout Rome during 225 BC. Now Corbin is in China in 202 BC, where an army is preparing for battle. Corbin tells the crowd, Gentlemen, your emperor needs you one final time. Are you ready for the fight of your lives? The crowd seems like they are. Back at the edge of the cliff, where Corbin had been thrown off by Sarvar's men all those years ago in 1504 in Samarkand, we see the same conversation taking place again and replaying itself when the guards are about to throw Corbin off of that cliff where the wild dogs would supposedly finish him off. But instead, this time we see a flash right behind the guards' backs, and Corbin says, No, you're the one that's dog food, buddy. Corbin and the military army he has just built comes up from behind the guards who were originally throwing Corbin off the cliff, and the guards are then killed instead. Corbin he had actually gone back in time to make sure it happened this way instead, and so he would survive and continue on his mission to find Danny. Then Corbin and his army of soldiers from across time approach the palace grounds where he was once treated like a king, and he radios over to his army, Quindu Battalions, advance the troops. Corbin's troops begin closing in on the palace grounds and they start to explode everything into smithereens. General Servar is running for his life as this new battle is taking ground on the palace that he had now taken over as ruler. Servar runs into a room and closes the door behind him. Corbin closes in on the door, but he can't get through. Inside the room is Servar and his men still holding Danny down. Corbin, he prepares to blow his way into that room. Corbin yells to Danny, Danny, can you hear me? Hit the goddamn floor! Corbin time jumps away from the door, and then he enters a military fighter jet, and he repeats to Danny, I said hit the floor, Danny. Danny does so. Corbin, in that jet, shoots off some bombs down below, instantly killing Servar and his men, while Danny was safely and patiently waiting near the wall for his rescue. Later on, the two friends start catching up. Danny tells Corbin, We need to fix this man. This is all just so totally out of control. Corbin responds, What are you talking about? Everything's been taken care of now. Danny continues, Dude, there's a gang of samurai riding a tank. Can't leave the time stream looking like this. We need to go back and fix our mistakes. Back to the moment I first came back and we can go home like none of it ever happened. This, Corbin responds, Forget about it. I got no wife, no family, no nothing outside of the lab. I screwed up my life for this bullshit project. I'm not going back. There's nobody waiting for me. Danny tells Corbin, So, fix it. Fix your mistakes when we're fixing all of this other stuff. You say you didn't make time for people? Well, now you got the chance to be in two places at once. Corbin asks him, Are you serious? Danny tells him, hey, you'll never get another chance to show up for the dates you missed or the times you wish you spent with your dad. Just head back now and be there for all the times you were missing. Who's gonna know? Corbin decides to do just that, do the things he neglected to do in his personal life the first time. He time jumps to 2008, when he first was dating Rachel. On that particular night, he stood her up while she was waiting at the ballet for him. 
Apparently they were going to see Robocop the ballet, which sounds pretty fun. <laughs> Corbin instead now arrives in time for their date and did not stand her up. Then later on, on a rainy night when Rachel was left stranded while needing a ride home, Corbin was pleasantly awaiting her arrival at home with a warm meal and a champagne bottle in hand. Then in 2010, and throughout the course of their relationship, he started showing up. He always showed up when Rachel had expected him to, and more. After years of forming all these new and wonderful memories with Rachel, we see Corbin approaching a house. He rings the doorbell, and it's his father, still alive. His father answered the door. His dad kind of looks like a cross between Kurt Russell and uh, Jeff Bridges. Corbin has made things right with his dad, too, and formed new memories with him. His father wasn't expecting this pleasant surprise this day with his son visiting him. Corbin brings his father a hot pizza and says to him, You got your uh, AA meeting tonight, Dad. To this, his father says, Oh, you don't have time for stuff like that. And Corbin tells him, What are you talking about? What's more important than you? After eating their pizza together, Corbin tells his dad, Now come on, get in the car, I'm driving you here every week from now on. After Corbin has successfully mended the relationship with his dad and with Rachel, and after him and Danny have successfully fixed the time stream, they now go to do what they were originally supposed to do on this time travel mission. They go back to the Americas in 1492, where the two of them will finally get to see Christopher Columbus arrive in the new world, and they will film it. Corbin first meets Danny back there, and he reports to him about his dad and all of the other updates that were so important to him. Corbin says, That's four years that my dad's been sober. I couldn't be happier. I also went back to school and slipped myself the answers to a test I got a B on once. I know I was only six at the time, but it always rankled me. Danny tells him he's so weird. They begin recording this momentous moment of Columbus arriving. As they're filming it, looking at Christopher Columbus, Corbin comments, He's certainly fatter than in the paintings. Danny replies, He's Italian, dude. Give him a break. The two of them have much to look forward to. Not in the past, nor in the future, but back home, in the present. Dr. Corbin Quinn and Dr. Danny Riley, they then finally return home to the present day. After being gone for an impeccable total of eight minutes, apparently. Eight minutes to everyone there, anyway. No one is aware of their time shenanigans. Everyone all over the world is watching them return from this mission. Danny hands over the camcorder containing only the relevant stuff to report back with. And Corbin's wife, Rachel, is waiting there with apparently a newborn daughter. Rachel tells Corbin, Hello, genius. Your daughter and I missed you while you were off making history. Corbin looks back at his wife and new daughter, and for a moment there, he can't believe that this is his new reality. Through his course of action, he has changed history, and it actually worked. Corbin returned back to everything he could have ever dreamed of, and more. It looks like his father's message to him truly ended up ringing true for Corbin. After a little restoration and dedication, time and love towards the relationships that mattered most to him, his dreams did come true. He has his wife, a new baby, and his dad is still alive too. His dad joins in on a group hug of Corbin with his family. His dad tells him, beautiful family and a Nobel Prize on the way, I really couldn't be more proud. And to this, Corbin tells his father, thanks dad. While Corbin is catching up with his family, Danny thinks about the woman that he has returned back to. He then approaches Cindy Porter, the CNN news reporter that we met earlier, the one who was Danny's love interest from before he left on the mission. Danny tells Cindy, All's well that ends well, huh? The only way this could be more perfect is if I declared my love and proposed, Miss Porter. What do you say? Should we make this day even more monumental? To this, Cindy tells him, Well, I'm not sure my husband would be too happy with that, Dr. Riley. Then all of a sudden, a bunch of grown-up kids run over to Cindy as they hug their mom. We then see that 
Mannix is back now too, and he is hugging his wife, who's Cindy. Corbin realizing some of their time travel shenanigans has changed things a little bit for Danny, tells him, Danny, I'm sorry, must have been a ripple effect from the changes we made. Danny, he doesn't seem very amused by this outcome and what he himself has ended up returning back home to. This isn't what he signed up for, as Mannix is giving Danny the middle finger and Corbin is embracing his loving family. Danny is left solo for now, and he exclaims, Shit. And with that, we conclude Chrononauts Volume 1. Alright, so that was Chrononauts. Let me go through my thoughts on this one. The artwork by Sean Murphy was pretty decent. I thought the overall story was pretty amusing. I had a fun time. It was entertaining. I do have to say, though, this book was pretty rushed. It was only four issues. The whole thing was very surface level. But you know what? This is a dumb, fun, silly book. It's not trying to be anything more than that. And it was highly entertaining. Mark Miller, he often writes his books kind of like on this movie pipeline where he writes these movie pitches as books. And then often they do get adapted as movies or TV shows. So he's pretty successful at that. Sometimes I do wish he would go deeper on some of his books and try to really push himself to say something more significant, but still, he writes entertaining stuff, even if it is surface level at times, and this one was a really fun ride, and it would be a fantastic movie, so I enjoyed it. I'm going to give this one a 7.5 out of 10. Let me know your thoughts in the comments if you enjoyed this bro time travel adventure, and I will see you all again in the future.